Well met by moonlight, dear ones. I am Curiosity, and this is my jamboree. A firelit gathering for explorers of the uncanny, the frightening, and the hard to explain. Tonight, we spin tales of murderous intruders, observant strangers in the dark, and guardian angels. So settle in by the crackling fire, lean in close, skewer some marshmallows, and let's begin. Our first story is from r slash creepy encounters, shared by Obi Ron Kenobi. This happened to me when I was nine years old, twenty-eight years ago, but I still remember it so vividly. I lived at the time in a seaside resort called Blackpool in England, in a modest four-bedroomed house. The area itself was good with very little crime or concern. Until that night. I shared a bedroom with my brother. We had bunk beds and I was on the top bunk. The bedroom was on the first floor at the rear of the property. My bedroom overlooked the back garden. One night, I was awoken by the sound of a window lock being tried. I opened my eyes and looked towards the bottom of the bed, which faced the four large windows. To my horror, someone was outside perched on the window ledge attempting to get in through my window. I froze in horror, not daring to allow them to see I was awake. I remember sliding back down into my bed, keeping as still as possible. I lay there for no more than a minute, but it felt like an eternity. My heart was beating that loudly I was sure it would give me away. With my eyes closed, I stayed still listening to them shuffle across to the next window. Unlike before, I could now hear a screwdriver or something in his hand, which was being used a little more forcefully to get in. Without moving, I opened one eye ever so slightly to see whether I could make out who this person was. A security light at the back of the property suddenly triggered mid-look. I panicked. Surely now he'd see me. Now he knew I was there. Staring back at me was a dark figure, black clothes wearing a matching balaclava, only his eyes on show this horrible, startled, piercing look. Clearly having been caught off guard by the security light, he froze and just stared. He didn't move an inch. I was now sat up, equally as stunned, staring back, locked by fear. I immediately jumped off the top of my bunk bed. There wasn't time for stares, screaming for my parents as I ran out of the room and into theirs. They tried convincing me it was a bad dream, and told me to get back into bed. There was absolutely no chance of that happening, and after a couple of minutes they agreed to go and investigate, which simply entailed looking through my bedroom window. Nobody was there. They'd gone. I got back into bed, still almost frozen with fear. What if he'd gotten in? He might be in the room right now. He could comfortably fit in my wardrobe or even under the bed. My brother, who was six years my junior, had slept through the whole episode and was no use. Looking down my bed towards the windows again, I noticed the latch on the fourth window. It had been left open inside. A simple pull from outside would have easily opened it. I shut my eyes. I remember silent tears falling down my cheeks. If he was in the room and knew I was awake, he might harm me to keep me quiet. Pretending to be asleep seemed the best option, and eventually I must have nodded off. I was woken up the next day by the sound of my cat outside, screeching in the garden. Daylight came through the windows, and the bedroom didn't feel anywhere near as scary as the night before. Cautiously, I walked towards my bedroom window. I noticed marks around the window locks from the outside, where the paint had been scraped. It wasn't a bad dream. My cat screeched again and I heard a commotion outside below me in the garden. Three police sniffer dogs were parading around and a policeman was stood talking to my mum. I rushed outside, but was quickly ushered back into the house, and was told to take the cat indoors. The look on my mum's face, I knew she was trying to hide something from me. The ambulance which arrived a short while later gave it all away. Apparently, it turned out, someone had broken into the house next door, through the back bedroom windows. The motive? Well, it appeared to have been a simple theft. But the elderly lady who came across the intruder had been found dead at the bottom of her stairs. 
the police never found out who it was. But then again, they never dusted our windows for prints, as my story was never told. We left the house and moved away within six months. I think my parents feel guilty for not listening to me and not acting differently. Even to this day, they don't wish to talk about it whenever I try and bring it up. When I reached out to Obi Ron, he told me the police never found the murderer. It's chilling to think what might have happened if he hadn't unfroze to run to his parents' room. Our next story was shared by Mash4380. This happened around three years ago. We went on a school trip to Wales, where we stayed at a place where we did many activities. It was extremely fun. I can still remember the last thing, clear as day. Anyways, we first spotted this man while rock climbing. Next to us was this forest, and one of my friends saw some figure at the edge of it, looking at us. When he told me, a lot more of my peers started to notice. We told our instructor that someone was there, and since it was private property, he and a colleague of his went to check it out. They came back, not finding anyone. The second time we saw this man was when some peers of mine ran away into the forest during orienteering to make out. They said they saw someone under this lamppost with a bike, just standing there and looking at them. I also had an encounter with this man. This was when we were sleeping around midnight or 1am, along with two of my friends, one sharing a bunk with me, the other on another bunk bed. I went to the toilet and suddenly the light turned off while I was using it. I was so scared, and when I came out I started screaming at my friends. And to cool off, I was sitting on the windowsill looking out. Our window looked out into the forest. I saw the man, and he saw me. He was wearing a long black coat, and I could barely see him in the moonlight, but I could tell he was looking at me. And then he started walking back into the forest. That was the last time I or anyone else in my year saw him. Well, let's hope whoever it was he was doing something innocent, although somehow I doubt it. Our last story was shared by T. I work for my city's water department. My everyday job consists of repairing leaks or doing new installations for businesses and homes. There are two parts to our water department that keep everything running. Distribution, where I normally work, and production. Production deals with the chemical side of things. They chlorinate the water and do water sample checks. Production is also responsible for the upkeep of our water well sites and our water storage facilities like the tall water towers you might have in your city. Mowing grass is one of those responsibilities. Both parts of our department are extremely understaffed right now, so we sometimes give the production guys a hand with the grass when they need it. A couple of weeks ago it was my turn, and here is where the weirdness begins. My city is in central Louisiana, with a population of about 45,000 people. We're surrounded by a wooded area, no matter which way you travel, into or out of town, you're going to see plenty of trees. As such, a lot of our well sites are located out in the boonies. Most of our city trucks are four-wheel drive with mud grips because it's needed more often than not. I had four sites to cut that day. I headed out just before sunrise to the one at the end of a long dirt road, where if trouble strikes, your phone better be charged, because no one is going to be able to hear you yell for help. Surprisingly... This isn't where my strange encounter took place. The sun was rising as I was approaching my first site, and on the road ahead of me stepped out a doe with her two fawns. Excitedly, I hurried to snap some pictures. To my surprise, the mama and her babies were not afraid of the loud rumbling diesel I was driving. The speckled fawns made their way across the path as the mum clearly watched me in the truck. Once the babies were safely across, she looked back the way she came, and then joined the little ones in the tree on the opposite side of the road. I breezed through my mowing, loaded the equipment back onto the trailer, and texted my mum the pictures of the deer as I headed back into town. My mum messaged me back, saying, 
I've read that deer are an omen of good fortune. Looks like you're going to have a great day. Be safe. I love you. And I did have a great day. I knocked out the next two sights without issue and everything was going smooth, until I reached the gate of the last place I had to mow. McKeithen's site is the biggest one we've had that's closer to town. It's about the size of a football field. It's not in the middle of nowhere, but it's on the outskirts of the city. There's normally plenty of traffic that travels the road there, so there's really no feeling of seclusion, even though it's surrounded by thick woods on three sides. I've cut this spot plenty of times, but that day felt different. I pulled the truck through and hopped out to lock the gate behind me. Immediately, I felt like I needed to get back into the truck as quick as possible. I made my way down the driveway to park near the tower, like I have many times before. But after I parked and killed the truck, everything felt heavy and silent. I don't know how long I sat until I was able to open the door and get out. Instantly, I felt eyes on me. The feeling was coming from the back right corner of the field outside of the fence, just in the tree line where the palmetto bushes grow. I calmed my nerves and reminded myself that I was surrounded by an eight-foot unclimbable fence, with the gate locked. Yeah, if someone had a gun, they could have shot me, if they wanted to. But they weren't going to actually get to me, if the barbed wire at the top of the fence didn't get them. A face full of weed-eater blades would. I jumped on the zero turn and took off mowing, keeping an eye on the back corner during every pass. After about two hours, it took multiple runs due to the overgrowth. I had the entire front mowed, and it was time to hit the back by the creepy corner. I was about to head that way, but the mower blades wouldn't engage. I had to take covers off, pull grass out of the belts, and out from under the deck. I had to grease the pulleys and do all sorts of troubleshooting. I finally got the blades going, but then the gaslight came on. I didn't realize it until later, but it felt like something was doing everything it could to keep me from going to that part of the lot. I finally got everything up and running and mowed the back as quick as possible, doing everything I could to keep my sight on the fence. I finally got done and loaded the mower. I still had to do a little bit of weed eating around that area, but when the weed eater wouldn't start, I knew it was time to go. I hadn't had an issue with it all day, but that was the last hint that I needed to get out of there. After pulling out of the gate and locking it behind me, I turned out onto the highway to head home, but not before looking at the back corner one last time. That's when I finally saw it, the unmistakable shadow of a figure standing in the palmettos. It wasn't trying to hide or make itself unseen. It was there. Being a safe distance from it, I stopped and watched. It moved to the side as if it were bending to try and see me better at the road. It had no distinguishing features, no hair, no clothes, just a person-shaped mass. I decided I had to get as far away from there as I could. The thought that I'd been so close to it for so long, and never saw it, sent chills to my core. I called my mum later that night and told her what had happened. She told me that she did some more reading about seeing the deer, and learned that they're a sign of protection, that some people believe that a deer means that a higher power is watching over you. After my mum told me that, I couldn't help but think, what if I'd not seen the deer that morning? Would I even have seen the shadow? Would it have been able to do something to me? Why did it choose to show itself to me? Is it something about me, or is it tied to that part of the woods? My mum texted me even later that night. She was sitting out on the back steps in my old little hometown, when she heard something rustling near her storage shed. She shined her light into the dark, and what stands there? But a deer. Deer have never come into the backyard before, and that night a large deer stood tall, staring back at my mum. She told me she felt like it was there to say, It's okay. He's safe. Don't worry. We got him. The sun is rising, and the dawn light looks just beautiful on the lake. The jamboree is at an end once more. My thanks to everyone who sent in stories, or gave me permission to narrate theirs. Remember, I upload new stories on Mondays and Fridays. So be sure to subscribe, and click the bell icon so you don't miss out. If you have any thoughts about the stories I've narrated, why not leave them in the comments below? And don't forget, if you enjoyed your time by the fireside, to braid the like button's hair and promise to keep in touch. If you'd like a story of yours narrated, I have a submission form linked in the description, and I'd love to learn more of your curious experiences and unexplained happenings.
I will see you soon, dear ones. And until then, may your nights be dark and your dreams just a little curious. <laughs>